In common with his artistic methods, Leonardo's scientific theories were based on precise observations. He wanted to discover the underlying laws which governed nature. It is impossible to isolate Leonardo's art from his scientific studies. He believed that his art was science. Drawing became an extension of his creative thought processes. Detailed studies of plants, animals and humans were part of an untiring quest to capture the absolute likeness of his subject. His sketch of a lily demonstrates not only artistic brilliance, but also the minute detail of scientific observation. One of the formative influences in Leonardo's life was his childhood in the Tuscan countryside. He was allowed to wander at will in a landscape whose changing moods heightened his awareness of the power of nature. It was here that Leonardo's enduring fascination with organic life began as he mastered the art of observation. Uh, with such persistence in solitude, he developed a remarkable artistic skill and a remarkable keenness of observation, which were in fact to out, uh, underlie his uh, uh, anatomical illustrations in the future. Until Leonardo, no one had studied the human body in such detail. It was considered sacrilegious to cut up human bodies. His use of dissection to uncover the body's innermost workings was to bring Leonardo into conflict with the church. Leonardo's unique approach to anatomy produced a new method of scientific study based on thorough observation. His notebooks are full of precise illustrations and supporting notes. He produced the first anatomical drawings which were of such quality that they have formed the basis for modern scientific illustration. As a medical historian, one would say that his important contributions to anatomy but the concept of sectional anatomy of the limbs, whereby anatomy was perceived in horizontal sections of the limbs. Leonardo also made astounding discoveries of the anatomy of the heart, and it is entirely conceivable that if his writings had not been lost, the discovery of the circulation of blood would not have had to wait for Harvey and would have occurred much earlier. Leonardo was able to unify areas of study which had previously been seen as distinct. Through his studies of the human form, which encompassed both the external and the internal, Leonardo produced figures of remarkable realism. His drawing, the proportions of the human figure, not only expresses the precision of his anatomical studies, it visually blends together mathematics and nature. Leonardo recognized that written explanations of complex issues could prove obscure. He knew that it was his drawings which would most effectively convey knowledge. Art became a method of communicating science. If the scientific and theoretical writings contained in Leonardo's notebooks had been made public, they would have revolutionized the science of the age. However, he did not choose to publish them. I think there are two problems here. There's a practical one. Uh, illustrated books were still very rare, and most of the illustrated books had woodcuts, which didn't deliver enormous amounts of quality. Now, if you think about Leonardo's drawings, how detailed they are, how perfect they are in their spatial definition, then he would have needed copper plates. He would have needed very expensive uh, engraving techniques, which are very difficult to print in book form. But the overriding problem is that none of the projects were wholly complete. He could always see the next step. He could always see something more to do. So there's this frustration of seeing this wonderful open-ended agenda. But how do you actually get a completed work out of that? And he never really solved that problem.
um, yes, quite a lot of what he did would have rev revolutionized uh, science and technology of that time, but he put it to good effect in as much as um, he published his work via those people who mattered most, namely those who employed him as the, the senior people of that society, dukes and so on. In 1482, Leonardo left Florence to work for Lodovico Sforza, the Duke of Milan. This association was to last for almost 20 years. In a letter to the Duke, Leonardo offered his services as a military engineer, demonstrating the extent of his technical achievements. In an age of war, this might have seemed an indispensable skill. However, Ludovico was more interested in Leonardo's expertise as an artist and sculptor. Handsome and gracious, Leonardo was popular at court and organized pageants and masquerades to entertain his patron. Despite his personable nature, Leonardo was at heart solitary. He did not allow court duties to deflect him from a single-minded pursuit of knowledge. While in Milan, Leonardo pursued his interest in mathematics. He collaborated with the mathematician Luca Pacioli and illustrated Pacioli's celebrated work on divine proportion. If we're thinking about Leonardo mathematics, we have to differentiate between the sorts of mathematics. Arithmetic was of some interest to him, but he was pretty poor at it. He couldn't add up many, a column of many figures without making mistakes. He wasn't at all interested, as far as you know, in algebra, which was available in rudimentary form, and it's geometry. It is geometry, which is visual mathematics. And he clearly saw geometry almost as a form of visual sculpture. He could take three-dimensional bodies and manipulate them geometrically. He could clearly see forms in space. So geometry became a kind of mental sculpture for him. And that is where his genius as a mathematician lies. The notebooks and sketches from those years in Milan reveal Leonardo's mastery of an ever-widening variety of subjects ranging from botany and geology to anatomy and architecture. His study of a star of Bethlehem is a masterpiece. It conveys not only the sense of movement and vitality which Leonardo always tried to capture, but also a degree of detail which is almost microscopic. He understood the effects of sunlight and gravity on plant growth, he discovered that it was possible to determine the age of plants and trees by studying their structure. One of the driving forces in Leonardo's life was his intellectual curiosity. He wanted to understand every aspect of the universe. Far in advance of 19th century Darwinism, Leonardo's investigations into fossil shells enabled him to formulate evolutionary theories. Leonardo was enormously interested in the Earth as a living body. He called it the body of the Earth. And he thought it had undergone enormous changes over time. Now, he saw that there were fossils on mountains, but for a variety of reasons, didn't think a single deluge, you know, the biblical deluge of seven days and seven nights, could get slow-moving creatures up that high and they were clearly alive on the mountains as he saw them. So there are a whole series of arguments like that. And he came to the conclusion that there must have been multiple inundations, and the Earth must have been submerged, and it's been subject as a kind of living body to huge changes over a period of time. Now, these ideas were not absolutely revolutionary, but had they been published, I think they would have caused something of a scandal. Leonardo's power of observation, when linked to his soaring imagination, was an invaluable tool in the many and various roles he adopted. In his own time, Leonardo was well known as an architect and sculptor. His architectural drawings include designs for the Dome of Milan Cathedral. If we think about Leonardo as an architect, it's difficult in the period to define what an architect was. There wasn't a body of professionals who you could call architects, and different people intervened at different points. I think I would describe Leonardo as a brilliant architectural consultant, but probably not an architect who built buildings. 
and his great quality as an architect was he could see space in a particular way. It's the same way he treated geometry. It was a form of spatial sculpture. And I think nobody had, at that period, a clearer vision as a, of a building as a way of sculpting space, of shaping space. And his drawings reflected that. And he had enormous impact upon Bramante, the man who built St. Peter's, or started St. Peter's. And that great, massive building, full of space and full of volume, is very much a product of the kind of vision he pioneered. Although none of Leonardo's architectural plans were ever realized, the skill and imagination they reveal is remarkable. Leonardo's scheme for palaces and roads at various levels had a practical purpose. In an age of recurring plague, this drawing was his design for a new and healthier Milan. Leonardo envisaged a city of space and light intended to prevent the spread of disease. This model city was on two levels. The upper level was to be pedestrianized, while carts and carriages, which formed the traffic of the day, were restricted to the lower level. Leonardo's notebooks indicate that he fulfilled a series of minor commissions for Ludovico. However, one major commission was a memorial to Francesco Sforza, the father of Lodovico. The memorial, which was destined never to be completed, was to be a colossal equestrian statue, cast in bronze. In preparation, Leonardo created a full-scale clay model. Its power and beauty were widely acclaimed. Leonardo's interest in animals was quite patchy in a way. He never followed what we would call zoology. That science didn't exist at the time. He was enormously interested in the horse. The horse was seen as a noble animal, and in fact he had two projects at least to do equestrian statues. So he investigated a lot of horse anatomy and horse proportions. He spent ages measuring the most beautiful horses to find out how the proportions worked as a kind of music of anatomical proportion, which he did with human beings as well. He seems to have dissected a bear, certainly a bear's foot. He was very interested in animal movement. There wasn't a systematic campaign of zoology, and he wasn't interested in classification, uh, essentially. So he had patches where he got suddenly involved with it. But it is the horse, and he is described as having done a book on horse anatomy. Not a finished book, but a manuscript on that subject. Uh, now lost, but we've got some drawings to show what he did in that area. So he really was, I think, effectively in zoology, a specialist in animal motion, and a specialist above all in the horse. Leonardo's interest went beyond the scientific. He had a love for all animals and birds. He bought caged birds in order to set them free. His own restless nature made him sympathetic to any creature deprived of liberty.